My name is Todd Marin with Quest Software. And in this session, we're going to talk about the four Active Directory security issues that we find are the most common based on two years of doing security assessments. So quick agenda, we're going to look at why we should care. We're going to look at the anatomy of an attack, talk a little bit about the environment that you inherited, our security assessment, what it is, how we perform it, and then we'll look into the findings and how to remediate some of the issues that we find. When we're looking at attacks, 52% of the attacks and breaches are caused by malicious attacks. So these are individuals, groups that are trying to steal data from companies, and 52% are malicious. Now, what's really interesting, if we look at the number of data breaches that are caused by human error, that's 23%. So this would be sharing a link that has anonymous access, just leaving something open to anyone on some sort of shared folder somewhere, on some shared storage in the cloud. This also causes issues. 80% of breaches include PII data, customer PII data. And what I find really interesting is this 280. So this is the average time to detect and contain a data breach. At one point, this number was, a few years ago, was like a 260, uh, dropped down to about 209 days. We were obviously getting better at doing our jobs, but then it looks like recently the attackers have gotten better at doing their jobs and they're able to go undetected for a longer period of time. So let's look at the anatomy of an attack. This really hasn't changed much in 10, 20 years. So it normally starts with compromising a user's credentials. Now, this could take place via phishing scam. Phishing emails, phishing scams have gotten very sophisticated, very convincing. That's where most of it starts. You can also do brute force attacks or spray attacks to also try to guess at somebody's credentials. So brute force is where we would take 1,000 passwords and try them against a single account Whereas a spraying attack is kind of the opposite. We're going to take a couple of passwords and we're going to try those against a thousand accounts. Once we establish a beachhead, we try to get into the environment, compromise the workstation, and then we try to move horizontally throughout the environment. Of course, this happens because, let's say, a company set up all their workstations with the same logon and password for the administrator account, for the local admin account. Well, if we can compromise that particular account, then we were able to move horizontally throughout the entire environment. Also, the account that they compromise may have access to a set of servers, a set of workstations where we can move around to those workstations and then try to elevate our access with other accounts that have logged into that workstation. So maybe it was a help desk account that has some elevated privileges. We can then use pass the hash, pass the ticket type techniques to then move to other machines, continue to elevate our access. The next thing an attacker is going to want to do is try to create a bunch of backdoors. So we've moved around the environment, we've started to elevate our privileges, and now we're going to create backdoors, additional accounts, add ourselves to groups that have more power on the network. So make sure that we can persist on the network. And then, of course, we want to try to harvest data from the network. All right, so let's take a look at what you've inherited. So first of all, one of the amazing things that we've noticed is that Active Directory has been around for a while. So most of the environments that we go into, Active Directory was established sometime around 2000, 2005, 2004. So we're looking at you know Active Directories that are 13, 14, 15, 16 years old. I think the oldest one I've worked on was from 1999. So that was an NT domain that was upgraded and continuously upgraded until recently. So that was a very old domain. Think about when you came into the picture. You probably weren't the person who set this environment up, who established the policies, how it's going to be managed and governed. Probably not. So you inherited a lot of sort of legacy artifacts that were left behind from sort of maybe poor policies, poor processes, poor governance. So finding those and understanding what your risk is in these environments is critical. So what we do is we execute our security assessment. And our security assessment is what allows us to start to visualize some of these risks. And the way we do this is we use a tool called Enterprise Reporter. So this is a Quest tool that we make. And we use that to collect data throughout the enterprise. We then take that data and we put it into Power BI. And Power BI allows us to visualize that data. Of course, there's lots of other ways to do this. You could use PowerShell script uh, and different techniques to you know, gather the data. Power BI is a great tool for visualizing the data. 
And I'll give you some links to some resources at the very end. So you can go and play with these tools if you want. So Enterprise Reporter, I'll put a link in for that. Also a link to my GitHub repository, which has a PowerShell script and um, a Power BI template that will allow you to do some discovery on service accounts, which is an interesting area. All right, speaking of service accounts, let's talk a bit more about service accounts and what we find there. Few issues. Service accounts usually have super old passwords. You know, it's a user account that we just put SVC in front of <laughs> to denote that it's a service account. And we generally don't change the password on these service accounts because that means bringing down the service. It's having some downtime for a little bit. And if you don't need to do that, why? So we find that with service accounts, the passwords are generally anywhere from five to 10 years old. If the password is complex, that's not such a big issue. But what the bigger issue is, are there users that were at the company at some point who have now left the company who knew these passwords. So any admins in your environment that knew these passwords at one time were no longer with the company, well, this means that this password is walking around in the wild. So there's exposure there. So that's the first issue we find. We also find that we discover services that are no longer being used. They're still running on a server somewhere, and they're an application that they used at one time, but they migrated off or moved on to a different application. So why are these services still around? Why are they using resources? Why do I have the exposure of this service account uh, still running in this environment if it's not needed? The other issue we find is that service accounts are generally over-permissioned. It's very, very common for an administrator when setting up the network or the environment or the service to just put them into domain admins or some sort of very privileged group. So that's an issue. We should definitely try to figure out what type of access a service account needs and give that service account just those permissions. But generally, when we're working, we just need to get things done. And so that's sort of the easiest way to get these services up and running quickly. Also, unconstrained delegation. We find a lot of services are configured for unconstrained delegation, which means that that service account can impersonate any other account on the network. That's kind of an issue because if I have a service account that has a password that's 10 years old and that account gets compromised, then I can impersonate any other user on the network, then I could elevate my rights pretty easily. So these are the common issues we find around service accounts. So how do we deal with these? Well, first of all, if we can, let's use a group managed service account. A GMSA is really just a kind of a hybrid between a user account and a computer account. A computer changes its password every 30 days with a domain controller. Well, a group managed service account is similar in that it behaves like a user account, but the server that it's running on can be allowed to manage the password for that particular account. Now. Not all applications support group managed service accounts. So if that's the case, let's uh, at least rotate the passwords. So to have some sort of process or policy where we can go in, we can update the passwords and of course make the passwords complex. Now, the other thing I like to do also is I like to audit service accounts. So for example, if I have a service, let's say, let's say it's a CRM application and it's being run with a service account. Well, that particular service account should probably never modify group memberships in Active Directory, create users, reset some other user's password. So we can audit these accounts. We can audit the service accounts to make sure that they're only working within a defined scope. And if for some reason they start doing things outside of the scope of what they need to do, then we need to be alerted to this and we should uh, start to investigate. And of course, Quest, we have a tool called Change Auditor, which helps you monitor and get alerted on exactly these types of things. The next area that we find a lot of issues are with user accounts. And this is interesting. So a lot of user accounts where we find the password never expires, the account hasn't logged in for years. There's issues with over permissioning these accounts, password reuse, simple passwords. So these are things that we need to address. Now, as far as having accounts where the password never expires, this may or may not be an issue. A lot of organizations, they don't require the password to expire after a certain amount of time. Instead, if there's some sort of security incident, then they will force that user to change their password at that point. But we do have to think about, well, wait, if this password is 10 years old, what was our password policy at that time? Did users have the ability to create an 
eight character password and what was the complexity requirements on that password. And as you can see in this chart here, that eight character passwords are pretty easy to crack. You know, being able to rent out GPUs and throw a bunch of uh, hashes at it and let it brute force those, we can crack those pretty quick. So we need to think about when these passwords are created, do users know how to create good passwords? And so maybe we do want to force them to change your password if their password hasn't been changed in five years, 10 years, something like that. Scale accounts. If we have accounts that haven't logged in for years, why are they still in the network? If they're enabled and not logging in, what are they being used for? A lot of times we find that these accounts were used for a particular project. Project has ended and the account is still around. So this causes problems in that it opens up basically a surface area of attack. As far as educating our users about passwords, one of the things we want to make sure is that users know how to create good passwords. This is a page from Wikipedia, which shows some of the most common passwords from 2012 all the way up to 2019. I think it's pretty interesting that in 2011, uh, you start seeing Dragon show up. And then as we move throughout the years, it becomes less and less popular. But this is the same time that Game of Thrones was released. So kind of makes sense. But these are common passwords. A lot of times you see they're just patterns across the keyboard. But we want to teach our users how to create good passwords that can't be guessed easily, but they can remember easily. The other thing that's very important is to educate our users on password reuse. So if I reuse my same password, as complex as it is, on all sorts of different services, if one of those services gets compromised, and my password is exposed, this means my password is going to be exposed in all of these other websites and uh, possibly the corporate network. Of course, I can go to LinkedIn, find out where the person works. I can guess at their format of their email address. I could try to log in with that compromised password, and now I have access to their corporate network. So education for users, huge. The other thing we find with users are that they have too many rights. And this occurs most of the time because of poor governance or not very well-established governance of uh, user accounts. We're pretty good at creating a user, putting him in the right groups. Great, create a user. He's in the sales department, so we add him to the sales groups. Now, what happens as this user changes roles within the organization? So now I've gone from sales, I've gone to marketing. Normally, the way the administration occurs is the admin will say, okay, well, they're in the marketing department. So let's put them in the marketing groups. Let's change their department to marketing. Okay, great. What about all the sales groups? Well, we better leave them in there just in case. So as time goes on, users start to hoard rights. They start to gain more and more privileges on the network as they sort of move throughout the company. So this is an issue. And a lot of this is because we are governing and administering the network with tribal knowledge as opposed to creating some sort of policies and automation. The other thing we found with accounts is accounts that are trusted for unconstrained delegation for whatever reason. Once again, these accounts are allowed to impersonate any user on the network. So this can be an issue if one of these accounts gets compromised. So how can we mitigate these issues? Well, like we said, Let's start to automate some processes. Instead of managing users using tribal knowledge, let's wrap these up into a policy and automate the administration of these accounts. For example, if I move from sales to marketing, then there should be a policy that says, okay, if you're in marketing or if you're in sales, you are in these particular groups. But if you move to marketing, we're going to take you out of sales. I'm going to put you in these particular marketing groups. And of course, there are going to be a lot of other sort of automation pieces that take place. Quest obviously has a tool for this. Active Roles is one that I like to use. And I'll give you a link to all these at the end. But automation is huge. Then let's make sure we have a modern password policy. Let's make sure users know how to create good passwords that aren't easily guessed, but they can easily remember. Turn on multi-factor authentication. So something you know and also something you have. Make sure that users only have enough rights to do the things that they need to do. A lot of this can be solved, once again, with automation and wrapping up the administration of these accounts with policies. The next thing would be for our admins. Our admins should be using a privilege access workstation. Microsoft has lots of documentation, which shows you exactly how to set up a privilege access workstation. But this would be some of the administrators would use to do admin type duties as opposed to sort of their day-to-day -day duties. Another option would be to use the enhanced security administrative environment, also known as a red forest. And Microsoft has documentation on how to set that up. And at minimum, what you could do is create a tiered model. So in tier zero, that would be your 
GCs. Tier one, that would be your servers. Tier two would be all your workstations and user devices. Now, if I need to administer domain controllers, I would have an account that I use in tier zero and tier zero only. This account would not be used to log into resources in tier one or tier two. Same would go for tier one. I would have an account that I would use to administer tier one resources, and that account would not be used to log into DCs or anything in tier two. So this will minimize the damage that can be done if one of these accounts gets compromised. All right, let's talk about groups. In all the environments that we go into, we find a huge amount of empty groups. Usually this is upwards of a thousand empty groups in their environment. Now, this is a problem because this opens up the surface area of attack. Think about what do these groups have permissions to? Just because a group isn't domain admins or enterprise admins doesn't mean that that particular group doesn't have some sort of elevated access on certain resources or access to certain data. Finding these groups and understanding what they're for, are they needed, and get rid of them if they're not needed, I think is a start to taking care of this issue of these empty groups. The other thing we find are that users are often in groups they don't need to be in. So for example, account operators or administrators or domain admins. Microsoft recommends that these remain empty. They should not contain user accounts. They should only be used when there's a either build or a disaster recovery type situation. So looking at these groups, understanding if the users really need to be part of those groups. If they don't, remove them. If they do need to be there, okay, fine, keep them there. But we can also make sure that we audit the members of these privileged groups to understand what they're doing and get alerted if there's something they're doing that looks suspicious. It's also a good idea to go back and make sure that the members of these groups need to be in these groups. Do this once every quarter, once every six months. Go back and attest to the memberships. The final issue that we're going to talk about are just operating systems. So what's interesting is we still find a lot of legacy operating systems in the environment. So, for example, Windows 7, as you can see, support ended January 14th, 2020 for Windows 7, which means that there are no more security patches being made for this particular OS. So at this point, we need to move away from these OSs. We need to get rid of them. We need to upgrade them. Now, in some industries, this is easier to do than in others. A lot of times there are applications that are running on these particular devices. The application doesn't necessarily support a newer operating system. And if that's the case, of course, we want to either push the vendor to give us an update, maybe move to a new application if possible. But if there's no way to move away from it, then we definitely want to audit these particular machines and watch their behavior. All right, so here's a few of the tools that I mentioned. We have a list of the Quest tools, Enterprise Reporter, Change Auditor, Active Roles. We mentioned those earlier. Microsoft Power BI, an incredible tool for that data visualization. And then if you wanted to play around with a PowerShell script to collect service information and pump this into Power BI, there's both the PowerShell script and the Power BI template up on my GitHub repository. So check that out. Hope you enjoyed. Thank you very much.